Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Everton show. Now the Merseyside Derby gods aren't exactly smiling down on us are they? It was a wretched international break with regards to injuries but Everton will go into the 228th meeting in excellent Premier League form. To assess the challenge that awaits us across the park on Saturday lunchtime I'm joined by Ian Snowden and the man whose managerial career with the Blues started with a win against Liverpool. Joe Royal, welcome to the Everton show Joe. Thanks Darren, great Merseyside to be Merseyside derbies, nothing like them. Uh, particularly being a local boy, you know, there, there aren't so many local boys in it, but there will be a few this year, hopefully. Um, great days, you look forward to it. The little cross on the calendar, you know, as soon as these fixtures come out, they're the ones to be in. And reputations can be made in these games. Looking forward to it, not Very much so. Apprehension, tension, but hopefully a Blues victory. Everybody's looking forward to it. It's a Merseyside derby weekend, and there's plenty to get through, as always, on this week's programme. The fun to meet up tonight to see Joel, uh, Robles and, and Leighton Baines. Uh, obviously uh, myself and Snod's Diamond and Sheeds are here as well. What a strike. <laughs> but what about the celebration? Left a, lot, <laughs> yeah. left a lot to be desired <laughs> by the way. Diamond and Daz celebrated it more than you in the commentary. Merseyside derby is as big as all of them. Um, so it's, it's, it's one I'm looking forward to and you know we, we do a win so uh, hopefully it can come Saturday. Well, he's right up there in the Premier League because he's top scorer. And I don't think it's a one-off season. I think his goal-scoring record since he came to Everton has been, been outstanding. You feel the, the importance of the fans to have a good result this Saturday. It's a long time ago and, and every time more uh, they are more hungry to, to win the game. As I mentioned there, Snod's wretched luck with regards to injuries in this international break and none more so than for Seamus. Yeah, it's a massive blow for Everton Football uh, Club, for, for the team, uh, but more solely for, for him himself personally. Uh, he's a great lad, Seamus, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a bad title. He'll be sorely missed. He gives us that balance down the right-hand side. He gives us that threat of going forward. But first and foremost, you like to think of the player himself uh, the, as a lad. He's a fantastic lad, got a lot of time for him. And I know you sent me his, uh, his number, Daz. I texted him, wished him all the best, fully... Hopefully he gets a fully recovery and uh, we, we, it were only last week that we were with the Down Syndrome lads mm. and he, he were fantastic with them and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to know. You know the boy from Finch Farm, Joe, as well. And he's the sort of character that will bounce back. Of course he is. He's strong. He's very strong. He, he's very strong mentally. I know that he took it particularly badly last season when we were having a bad time. You know, he was... He didn't get grumpy about it, but you could see he was hurting. He has this public spirit that, that Snods had mentioned as well, you know, and he's, he's bought season tickets in the past. He, he's just as, as good a guy as you can meet. And by the way, you know, don't forget, he's arguably the best right back in the, in the Premier Division. So uh, we are going to miss him, there's no doubt about it. We've had in excess of 1,500 emails and letters, as well as the many thousands of messages on social media, because he's such a popular guy. Yeah, and it's not only from Everton fans, it's from around the world. Uh, he'll be missed with Ireland as well, but uh, that's the kind of lad, lad he is. He, there's no airs and graces about Seamus, from when he's at Finch Farm to when he's on a football field. He gives the same performance at Finch Farm if he's talking to, to people in general or he's on a football pitch. He doesn't change his attitude one little bit. Ronald Koeman, Joe, must have been thinking to himself, I'll have to use Funes Mori now at right back or somewhere in the back four. <laughs> 24 hours later, he's gone as well. I know, and it's, it, it's been a hard week for, for Ronald. He's, um, I know he, he's willing to put the younger players in if he feels they're ready. We've already seen that with, with Tom Davis. And now he might have to look at maybe, I don't know, John Joe Kenny, Matthew Pennington, uh, Mason Holgate. You know, so they, they're there waiting for their chance, but it doesn't alter the fact that... Seamus will be missed. Do we need international friendlies at this stage of the season, Snods? It's the no. age-old argument, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. You wouldn't think so. Uh, I think Roberto Martinez, our, our ex-manager, left Romelu out of his friendly, uh, which was a good idea. But then 
James McCarthy uh, was ready to play for, all right, that was a, a proper game against uh, Wales, but pulled up uh, with a hamstring injury again. So it'll be touch and go whether James is fit as well. So yeah, it's come at a bad time, these injuries. It really has. And against all teams, we need a full strength team because we want, we want to beat them. <laughs> just our luck before the derby, Joe. Yeah, it, it, you've just got to hope it comes right on the night because, well, obviously it's not nice, but it's lunchtime, but right on the lunchtime, if you like, because, you know, it can happen that way. You know, just when you think everything's going wrong for you, all of a sudden, I guarantee you this, whoever comes in will be playing for their place. You know, there's, there's going to be one up, one place up for sure that for the rest of this season, and that, that's, that's Seamus's position. So whether it be Mason or John Joe or Matty Pennington, they'll know there's a great chance of playing their way into the team. A couple of seasons ago, Tyus Browning came in for a Merseyside derby yeah. and was terrific, not Yeah, and I was talking to him only yesterday as well at, uh, at Finch Farm and he's picked up an injury while being on loan <laughs> at Preston, yeah. but, which I didn't realise because I know my brother says who's at Preston that Tyus has been doing very well. Didn't know he picked up an injury. Just all look before a Merseyside derby. Right, the season ticket deadline to guarantee your seat is next week, 6th of April in fact, and to remind supporters, we staged a special event at Camp and Furnace in Liverpool earlier this week. Snods was there, so were Leighton Baines, Joe Robles, Graeme Sharp and Graeme Stewart. Great to see, the, I think, the, the, the punters have made up tonight to see Joel uh, Robles and, and Leighton Baines. Uh, obviously, uh, myself and Snods, Diamond and Sheeds are here as well, Tony Bellew. So it's a great night for the supporters, it's a little bit of a reward as well. It's good to come down, the uh, room very busy, a lot of people in there and um, I thought it went well. It looks like a sort of event that's been really well put together so, you know, it's good for the, the club to be able to put things like this on. It's good for us to be able to turn up for a little bit and, as I say, share a few anecdotal stories or whatever and um, just the added bonuses, I suppose. Uh, they'll see the, the, the new video, which was uh, really good to take part in. But you know, this is for the supporters. You know, we've had a, a good uh, season ticket renewal, and this is just an opportunity for for those who are just deliberating whether to get a season ticket for next year, just to, to push them over that line and say, listen, uh, we're on the way up. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of positive vibes in the in the in the football club at this moment in time. It shows how massively important the supporters are to create. Uh, an atmosphere that makes you get the best out of you as a player. Um, as I said in the video, um, Goodison Park, 40, 50,000 supporters right behind you, uh, sucks every last bit of energy and performance out of you. You know, it's good to see the likes of Duncan, uh, Unzi, Joe Royal, Sheeds on there, you know, and all just, you know, saying similar things really, and, you know, what a fantastic club it is. and. What a great, great club it is either to play for, have played for, or be working for, and I think that's you know part of the great thing about you know the football club is that those guys, the ex-players, are, are still here, are doing important jobs at the club and doing you know really well as well. So um, yeah, it's nice to come down and you know get a first look at the video. You were there, Snod. You weren't in the film a great deal, but. The bits that you were in, you looked like you were enjoying yourself. Yeah, well, we they saved the best till last. Me and Diamond <laughs> went on last of all. There was, Top of the bill. Yeah, Tony Bellew was there as well. Uh, Tony went on with uh, Joel Robles and Leighton. They opened it up and, uh, and then Sharpie and Sheeds went on. I was quite surprised. Sheeds got a few laughs and uh, <laughs> I wonder what stories they were telling. But no, great turnout by the Evertonians. Good night and I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. You and I have done countless question and answer sessions at various supporter events, Joe. They're always good fun, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And, you know, the, the good fans, uh, you know, you, they're hard to get away from at times. You know, I've, I think the latest was about 1.20 in the morning. We got away <laughs> from one at uh, Goodison. But, um, no, they're, they're the real fans, the people who want to be there, want to see you. That's where you get your feedback, Snods, isn't it? Your good feedback. Yeah, they don't ask for much, do they? An autograph or a picture. You, if you can't give an autograph or a picture, then it's, times are hard. But uh, no, the, uh, they turned out in the droves. There were about 600 there, Daz, and they thoroughly enjoyed it. Good good venue as well. And uh, everything went or seemed to go really well. By the way, a great turnout from the players as well as the staff as well. There, mm. you know, Because I do know a lot of clubs that have an awful lot of problems getting their players to these days. So well done, the players and the staff. 
And you've done a few player appearances alongside the first team players as well, Snods, and they always conduct themselves in the correct manner. Very much so. Uh, Big Joel, apparently quite funny as well on stage, throwing a few uh, Scouse accents about, <laughs> apparently, and uh, they were quite funny. But Baines is always at, at them. Uh, he's, he's a local boy, Baines. He loves to get out in the community amongst the fans as well. So, uh, yeah, as Joe said, the, uh, the first team lads don't mind getting out there, and uh, that's the responsibility these days. Tony Bellew's always there or thereabouts as well. He must be really busy, Joe, but he still helps us out. Oh, he is. He, he's, a, he's a big blue. He was, he'll be so fired up for this game on Saturday. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't want to upset him. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind sitting next to Tony Bellew, actually, at Anfield. He'd look after you, wouldn't he? And that's the end of part one of our Merseyside Derby special. After a short break, we'll be back with Gareth Barry and we'll show you what happened when Snods went to USM Finch Farm to check the pre-Derby mood. Welcome back to part two of this week's show. Now, since we lost against Liverpool back in December, Everton have suffered just one single setback in the subsequent 12 Premier League fixtures. Confidence is justifiably high, and the mood at USM Finch Farm is optimistic. But just to make sure, we sent Snods down there this week to get it from the horse's mouth. And who better to supply the feel-good confirmation than the skipper himself? I've got to mention the goal, Jags. Cop end. What a strike. <laughs> but what about the celebration? Left a lot, <laughs> yeah. left a lot to be desired, <laughs> by the way. Diamond and Daz celebrated it more than you in the commentary. Yeah, it's, it's weird people have asked me that. I've obviously been hammered by yourself included. You know, quite a lot of people have, have given me a lot of stick. But it was just, you know, I think there was a lot of frustration, obviously, in the game. You know, we, we, were, we were playing OK, but, you know, we managed to be losing 1-0. It was, it was getting late then. I say it was just... You know, an attempt that, that luckily went in and say no, no, no celebration planned. I don't obviously score too many goals. It was, as I say, I was quite numb. You know, I didn't really realise what had gone on. I think I just carried on doing a big loop and <laughs> jumped back into <laughs> position. But no, but you know that 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 sums up you know what what it sort of meant. You know, it was just you know just went into sort of a, a place of of no emotion and, and like you say the, the, the other lads and you know Dazzler and and, and, and Diamond of uh, numerous of times told me how they was jumping around in, in the in the box and things like that, which you know that makes it more special. You know, hear stories about how probably how other people celebrated rather than you know watching it. I watched the goal up to the point I've scored, then I cut it off. <laughs> I don't watch the celebration. <laughs> That's about it. But like I say it was it was a great moment. It'd have been possibly a bit nice if it was the winning goal, but. You know, that's probably been a bit picky. I know, because Sharpie always mentions it to you, doesn't he? Well, that definitely. It, it weren't the winning we, Yeah, goal. exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll get, still give it Sharpie. You know, <laughs> say, uh, I'm not sure it, it counts in black and white. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, we'll, we'll let him off with that one. I know in 87, when I joined uh, Everton, the first Merseyside derby I played in, Peter Reid came up to me. Uh, it was dead loud in there. The, the getter blaster would go in, there was passion. And Reid had come up to me, and he's changed now, football, I accept that. But Reid had come up to me and he said, for the first 20 minutes, son, forget the ball. Because you're not going to get a kick, there'll be tackles flying in. But it has changed a little bit. But what will it be like in that dressing room? Is there, is there a lot of lads that just relax before a game, or is there a few of you quite boisterous and urging the boys on? Um, I say quite a lot of lads do their own little thing. Obviously, there's, there's massages to be had. There's, there's even footage of, you know, if it's a strikers, you know, looking at what the defenders are doing, but vice versa. If you've got a, a player to play against, just refreshing your mind. You, know, you stick in your own groups and there's a little bit of, um, you know, there's obviously conversations and stuff, but it is quite mellow. I think that's, that, that, that's, that's something I've noticed from the start of mm. sort of your career t till now. Um, there's not too much um, shouting. Obviously, just before you go out and stuff, it'll start to heat up. Um, you know, you can you can sense the sort of nervousness and the you know the anticipation to, to, to what's going on. The lads sort of get a little bit louder. But normally, for the for the build up for the for the game, it is quite you know the music's on, like you say, that's that's sort of in the background. But the lads are all got their own little thing. The, probably the music they listened to last week that they scored a goal. Yeah. To, they put the same one. You know how yeah. superstitious we all are and, and things like that. But no, I, I, I get back in the day, um, it probably was the passion and all mm. sorts and you'd probably want the lads to be super fired up but you know the last thing you'd want is, is someone you know taking someone out within you know a minute or two when I was playing with 10 men and things like you know the way football's gone this, these days it's, it's a little bit more difficult to, to probably be as, as, as aggressive and as, as, as probably crazy as, as they were in, in 
obviously your day and stuff starts. But like I say the lads are used to doing things their own way. Might change slightly for the derby because there is obviously a little bit more on it. Um, but like I say it's it's all about being comfortable for when you start the game and and going out there and performing. Well, it's a big week for us. Uh, we've got the the derby on Saturday. We've got Man United at Old Trafford on Tuesday. Still a great opportunity to try and get in that top six. We're playing well. We're playing as well as anybody in the country, I believe. And uh, the two massive games for us. Yeah, well, that's a difficult thing. As I said before, it's it's hard to look past the derby, but mm. you know, it's it's one game. It's the last two games of the season, and you know, it's not it's not going to be the the defining point of where we finish and all sorts. But we also know that a good result and can kick us on to a, obviously a difficult away game at Man U, then then obviously a difficult home game at Leicester. But if we can have a really positive week and and really kick on, like you say, the potential to to, to knock on the doors for for those places that have, you know the teams above us keep losing or beating each other and things like that, we need to try and keep up the fight for as long as possible. I think that's the that's the plan for us to put ourselves in the mixer for as long as possible to to sneak up there and, and break into it. And the only way we can do that is by having positive results against the teams in and around us. And you looked as if you enjoyed that one as well, Snods. I did. I, I always think when, when you're doing things like that, we're not trained to, to do that kind of thing, uh, but I think you're as comfortable as the person you're interviewing. Mm. And I think with Jags, I'm comfortable. Uh, we had a good laugh before, good, uh, good laugh after it as well. So during the time I was interviewing him, I found it quite easy. And uh, yeah, he's, he's a good lad, he's Jags. He's another one of the good guys, Joe, isn't he? He's a cracker. He's, he's old school. Um, I slightly disagree with him there when he said it's not season defining. I think these next two games are season defining for us because at the moment we look a solid bet for seventh. If we could say get four points out of these two games, Darren, then you can start dreaming of maybe sixth or better. Did you notice the difference in pre derby atmosphere in the dressing room from when you were a player to when you came back as a manager? Um, it was changing though. There was were, there were the influx of foreign players. You know, the, it was getting to the stage when there were a few fewer and fewer Scousers in these games. But as a local boy, the, the build-up to these games was, was intense. Brian LeBone, you know, one of the greatest centre-halves this club's ever seen, hated derby games. He, he hated the tension that went with it. He just couldn't... He, he never let us down, but he, he just hated them. Do you like them, Snods? I'm quite boisterous, especially in the in the tunnel when she come out of the dressing room when both teams were lining up. That's when I seem to come alive. I seem to <laughs> have a have a shout and have a have a wind up of the Liverpool players and uh, whether it be at Anfield or at Goodison. So uh, yeah, I used to get uh, quite revved up for them. But uh, when you were in the same team as Reedy, uh, Dave Watson, etc., you, you couldn't do anything else. You had to look after yourself, or you get a you get a kick off them too. <laughs> and he was right, wasn't he? You didn't need the ball for twenty minutes. No, no. I I, I swear the first one I played at Anfield, I asked the referee how long had gone. He said nineteen minutes, and I'd not touched the ball. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't just derbies, no. though. Was it? <laughs> well, Jack's famous Stanfield goal came late on, and if you look at the stats, you wouldn't rule out another one this weekend. Okay, maybe not from Jags, but of all the teams in Europe's top five leagues this season, Everton have scored more goals in the last ten minutes of games than anybody else, and it's something that Gareth Barry says is no fluke. The, uh, the fitness team here, it's a, it's a, it's a great setup. Um, you know, it's different methods this season. Uh, the manager spoke pre-season about us not being quite ready uh, at the start, but he said we'll, we'll be able to finish the season strongly. And, you know, with stats like that, it shows that uh, the hard work's paying off, so they deserve a lot of credit for the, uh, the training structure we've, we've been under all season. And for as many top-class managers you've worked under, what, what impact do you think Ronald Koeman has had in the time that he's been manager? Um, I think he's impressed everyone. Obviously, the, the CV was there before he's, he's come in, and anybody's met him. But you know the way he's handled the, the squad, the individual players, the young players, the experienced players. He's got a structure for everyone. Uh, you know, we're not going out there just doing all the same training. Everyone's being treated differently. So the manager, he's being honest with everyone, letting them know where they stand, where they are, at, where their game is at. Um, so he's, he deserves a lot of credit. And how easy is it for the players coming back and the squad as a whole? from an international break to, to refocus on the next club game? Uh, it's not easy for the players at all. Um, they, they've obviously got to switch off from Premier League football and, and get their mind on, on playing well for their countries. Um, there's only a couple of days from them to get your mind back on, which is a massive game for everyone at the club. You know, These derbies, the, the, they're what the fans look forward to all season, so the, the players that are away have got to switch back on quickly and quickly get their mind on a massive game at the weekend. And obviously next up is the derby. Uh, someone who's played in Manchester and Birmingham derbies, where do you rate the Merseyside? 
Uh, any derby is huge, you know, it means so much to the fans. Um, the Merseyside derby is as big as all of them. Um, so it's, it's, it's one I'm looking forward to and, you know, we're, we're due a win. So uh, hopefully it can come Saturday. And as well as uh, the fact that it's what it means to the fans, it's, it is a big game in terms of keeping up tabs with the, with the top six as well. That's it. You, you've got to keep your eye on the big picture as well. It's uh, three points at the end of the day and we're on a great run. Uh, if we get one here, it will boost the confidence even more than it is at the moment. So there's, there's a lot going into the game. Joe, that's a terrific stat to have scored more late goals than anybody else in Europe. And psychologically, must be a bit of a boost. Well, it is. It means they're the fit and then they keep going and they've got the right spirit about it. You know, we're not totally depending on, on Rom for goals. It's nice to see lately one or two other people weighing in with a goal, like Anna Valencia got a great goal last week. Calvin Lewin... You know, weighed in with one. We've had one from Tom Davis not so long ago, and um, and you know, the, there's a feeling that the midfield players now can weigh in with a few. So we have goals in us and late on. The defenders, the Liverpool defenders, will have to be on their toes for the whole game, and they'll be saying, "Look, we can't switch off here, not not for a second. Yeah, that's where they struggle a little bit defensively, does. So I think. Uh... <laughs> If we're positive, we get at them. Uh, I think they're vulnerable at the back. I think we can score goals, create chances. Uh, going forward is a different story. Liverpool are quite lively, got good movement, so our defence are going to have to be strong, solid. Defensive midfield players are going to have to be aware of runners as well. So, But overall, uh, we can score goals. Big Rom's on, on absolute fire at the minute. But as Joe said, we've got other, other players in different areas can score goals and worry Liverpool's back four. Both teams to score might be the bet this week from the coupon. OK, we're taking another quick break right now, but don't go away because in part three we'll be getting the derby memories of Big Joe and of Snods and we'll hear from a man who refereed a few derbies in his time too, Jeff Winter. Welcome back. Now, my two guests this week played in enough Merseyside derbies to know what they're all about. Played a few, won a few, lost a few. Snod, suppose it's the greatest feeling in the world if you win, but you just want to run away and hide for a week or so if you get beat. Yeah, you're certainly right. I think it, it, it's a game for the fans, Daz. Uh, it's great as a group of players to turn your rivals over, go out and celebrate and think the big I am. But for the fans, it means everything. And on Saturday, even though I'm employed by the club, I'm an Everton fan, and if the boys can do it, I will celebrate <laughs> like a fan as well. So, uh, but yeah, I played in a few. Uh, one of the first ones I played in, Gary Stevens uh, in the League Cup, scored a, scored a left foot shot uh, into the bottom corner. So great celebrations then. But uh, yeah, you don't hide the fact when you get beat as well. You do go into hiding. You don't like to be seen uh, because there's obviously a lot of Liverpool fans ready to give you a bit of stake. But it's all part of the banter. Uh, you've just got to man up. Especially the players, when they walk down that tunnel, come half past 12, the game kicks off. Roll your sleeves up, give your all from the first minute to the last. If it's not good enough, you've got to accept it, but hopefully it will be good enough. In the 60s and the early 70s, Joe, when did the banter start? In the tunnel before you got out there? Um, yeah, I mean, there were, there were a few players obviously knew each other, you know. I mean, Johnny had grown up with Tommy Smith, you know, the Scotland road connection, so there was always a little bit of banter there. And mostly in the paper the night before, you know, I'd played in a few derbies and, and not really come to terms with them early on. And Ron Yates had said in the paper that, you know, he'd never had any too much trouble with me. And then, of course, I scored at the cop end and uh, that was sweet. <laughs> you know, and after the game, we'd won there 2-0 on the championship running. And my wife-to-be said to me, I think we'll stay away from town tonight, don't you? I said, we won't. And we went down to Tommy Smith's club to celebrate. <laughs> Joe, did you score at Goodison against him? Or, or just um, Anfield? I scored twice at Anfield. I scored against him for Bristol City, Manchester City, and I think Norwich City as well. I don't think I scored at Goodison against yeah. them, no. See, I, I never even crossed the halfway line when I played <laughs> against them. Never, somebody said that to me. Uh, did you ever score against Liverpool? I said, never even crossed the halfway line, yeah. <laughs> me, to be fair. But uh, it must be a great feeling. Oh, it, it was, well, particularly the cop end. Yeah. And, and as I said, we were on the run in then to go and win the championship. And we'd gone into this game knowing we'd lost the first game at Goodison 3 0, I think. Uh, but we certainly lost it. And. Um, if we had have lost that game as well, it would have been slightly tainted, you know. Mm. Or oh, you might have won the championship, but we did the double yeah. over you, that kind of thing. So winning 2-0 at, at Hanfield was 
Very sweet. <laughs> did you socialise with the Liverpool players in the 80s? Yeah, we did. Uh, Rushy used to uh, used to be big mates with Sharpie, and I was obviously close with Sharpie at the time. So, yeah, we socialised there. Uh, Ronnie Wheel and Steve McMahon, um, they lived by me in Burtdale Village. So, yeah, we had we had a little bit of banter, but yeah, from Friday till after the game, there was. I don't care if they were your best mates <laughs> forever, but for that uh, for that period of time, 48 hours. No speaking, just get the job done. If there were a tattle to be made between you and Ronnie Wheel and Steve McMahon, let him know you let him know you're about. So no friends. Not in any game, but especially in the derby, none at all. No social media, no mobile phones in the sixties and seventies, Joe. So I suppose Bless. you could you, you could go to town after the derby win. Well we did. I mean, as I say, we went down to Tommy's um Tommy's club, where he he was the bouncer on his own door, I think. Tommy, <laughs> and uh, he he just scowled at me because I'd scored. I'd jumped over Ray Clements and Big Ron, and headed it in. And he said to me, um, "Big Ron said it came off him. It was an own goal." I said, "Well, if he wanted that badly," and Tommy scowled. He said, "You better come in." And you know, <laughs> and that was the the it was fun. Roy Evans was my great friend. You know, we'd mm. played Lancashire schoolboys together. And then, of course, my first game back here as a manager, Roy was the manager then, you know, and uh, we still remain friends. He only lives about a mile, mile away from me now. But, as Snuds just said, 90 minutes madness. It was only, only one side he wanted to win. <laughs> it was written, written in the stars, wasn't it? You'd come back to Everton as a manager, first game against Liverpool. Yeah, I, I hadn't realised that. I honestly hadn't until I looked at the fixtures. And there it was, large, large, straight after a an international break and we'd had a bit of time to prepare and Liverpool at the time I think was second or third and we were plum bottom and we had time to prepare for it and uh, it was one of those famous Goodison nights I can I've, st I've still got it on a VHS or something it was a, a Sky game and uh, Sharpie was in the box and he looked at the team he said well I think Joe set the side out here to not lose this game you know and he might have been right you know we weren't ready to take them on after one win in 14 games but uh, some night. It was the night Duncan Ferguson became a legend. Well, one of the most important figures at the weekend at Anfield, and possibly one of the most influential, will be Anthony Taylor. He's the referee, of course, and supporters from both sides of Stanley Park will be hoping that common sense is very much a part of his performance. Well, one man who refereed a few derbies in his time and a man who enjoyed his visits to Merseyside is Jeff Winter. Remember him? We caught up with him at Middlesbrough recently to reminisce about the good old days. It's a love coming to Goodison, you know. In fairness, and you might not want me to say this, but I, I actually love going over the park as well. You know, old football grounds, fans close to the pitch, great atmosphere, great banter, and they still called me names, but at least they did it with um, they did it with a smile on the faces, a bit of humour. I was going to say, if you're refereeing at Goodison and Anfield, you've got to take the scouse humour on the chin, haven't you? Ah, oh, it's fantastic. You know, you, you used to laugh along sometimes, you know, I mean, all good stuff. Um, loved it, and whenever I get a chance, to go back there as you as you're well aware um i speak at um goodison on the hospitality each season but last season i, I pre-booked i didn't wait to be invited i said if the borough get promoted i'm coming back i did we had a great day apart from the borough you get you taught us a bit of a lesson it's always great to see you at goodison park and i read that uh, article in the middlesbrough program you sent off uh, the boy flitcroft at blackburn for his own safety tell us about that it was Grand National Day, um, Everton were at Blackburn and the kickoff got delayed, you know, obviously the traffic problems coming out of Merseyside and the game kicked off a little bit late and because the, the National used to be earlier in those days, it overlapped so a lot of the punters, the chairman and everything like that from Blackburn had stayed in the ground, stayed in the hospitality etc to watch the Grand National and came in five minutes into the game to see their new sign in, make his home debut, but he'd already gone after two minutes and I'd sent Gary Flitcroft off uh, a foul on um, Duncan Ferguson and like on your match report you're supposed to put down um, serious foul player violent conduct. I'm not sure whether I did or not but I did think about putting sent off for his own safety because <laughs> 87 minutes I'm sure Big Dunk would have got his own back. <laughs> Big Dunk easy to referee? I was a character. He's a Rangers man, so I had a lot of time for him. But, you know, I think at times football misses characters like that. I know he could, he, he could, he could hand it he could hand it out, but he could take it as well. But I didn't take the risk with Flitcroft. Um, but um, I wouldn't say it was easy to referee, but um, character that you could have some fun with. When you say he could give it as well as take it, so could the referees in them days, Jeff, couldn't they? 
It was a different game. I mean, if I'd have been wired up, I'd have, my career would have lasted about five minutes because, you know, if they said something to me, I'd give them it back. And, yet, you know, I, I pass that comment now. We've got some excellent referees. We've got, you know, some really top-class referees. The pressure they're under now, um, you know, the diving, etc., and the speed of the game, it's difficult. But I watch football. I'm at football two or three times a week. I can't remember the last time I ever saw a referee smile. You know, and a bit of band, a bit of band management. You did get a little bit of respect. The players were still trying to get away with getting a penalty, etc. Whatever that was part and parcel. But you could have a bit of crack and a bit of banter. Now everybody, it's just seems so serious, and um, that's not suggesting that it's a joke and we should all be out there laughing. But a sense of humour and a bit of crack with the players, I think that gains you a lot more respect than flashing red and yellow cards around. I'm sure you know. Jeff Winterwell, you'd have crossed swords many times, but he was from an era when the referees were, were characters as well. Well, you can tell that, you know, his personality is such you could have a laugh with him. And um, he used to tell the tale in his after dinner of when he'd sent Dave Watson off at Goodison and I was waiting for him at the top of the tunnel and he thought, oh God, this is going to be trouble. And I just said to him, Jeff, I said, for what it's worth, I said, you he had no choice. As the rules are, he had no choice. And we've been great mates ever since. He's, he's a great after dinner speaker, by the way. And You've just made a great point there, Snods. Don't referees look more authoritative in black? Yeah, I think it looks great, the picture there uh, of, uh, of Jeff. And then you're wearing your green, your green tops, your yellow tops. Good old-fashioned uh, referees, all black for me. But there were there some great referees. Mark Olsen was a great referee. He'd give you a bit back as well on the pitch. Keith Hackett, a uh, few years prior to, uh, to Jeff and to... Uh, Mark Olsey, he were great. You could have a bit of banter with him. Yeah, it seems to have gone out of the game. As he said, Jeff says the mic's up, can't really say anything back. And I don't think it's for the better. Merseyside derbies have changed, Joe. Yeah. But the referee's still got to apply a bit of common sense, hasn't he? Well, they have done that. They have in any game, you know. But this, he said there, there's so much pressure on the modern referee, you know. And I think a lot of honesty has gone out of the game, you know, as regards even contesting a throw in. Every free kick, every penalty that's given is contested, even if it's assault. You know, they, they, oh, why is that kind of thing? So it's hard. It's got harder and harder for referees. And they, they, they need a personality as much. They all know the rules. They all know the rules. They'd all get 99 out of 100 at worst on the rules. But, you know, there's some of them sometimes don't have the, the charisma or the personality to carry it off and uh, just have a smile and a wink and say, hey, I know what you're up to. Anthony Taylor is one of the decent ones. Let's hope he has a decent game at the weekend. OK, it's time for another break right now. And in the fourth and final part of this week's show, we'll hear from Jamie Carragher and from Ronald Koeman. We've reached part four of this week's programme. Now, only eight men have played more Merseyside derbies than Jamie Carragher, all in the bright red of Liverpool, of course. But Jamie was at our own USM Finch Farm when he spoke to the Everton show recently. He reckons that Romelu Lukaku was looking a much more complete centre forward than the Ronald Koeman, and that the man named as the Premier League Player of the Month for March is a worry for all Liverpool supporters. Oh, of course, that comes with maturity, experience as well. I'm sure working with Ronald Koeman, again, he. I go back to him sort of saying the same things a lot at the start of the season about terms of press and being compact and that starts at the front and that's something I think he, he possibly has to bring into his game. Goals are the most important thing and he is completely delivering his top goal scorer in the Premier League so he's having an outstanding season but to get to the real elite, the world class level I'm sure Ronald Koeman will be pushing him because that's his job as a manager, you can never be satisfied with what any player gives you, you're always pushing him to get more and more and maybe as a, his all-round game is something that they can maybe touch on and improve on, and then you're going to get the complete centre forward. As you say, he's right up there alongside Harry Kane and Alexis Sanchez at the moment for the Golden Boot. Where does he rank in the Premier League against some of the other strikers that are around? Well, he's right up there in the Premier League because he's top scorer, and I don't think it's a one-off season. I think his goal-scoring record since he came to Everton has been been outstanding. Uh, I mean, listen, different opinions. It is very close. I mean. I think there's probably four or five strikers now in the Premier League who you could make an argument for anyone. I think when Sergio Aguero is on form, I think he is, is the best one. I think he's, he's got the greatest goals to minutes record in the Premier League, so I think you have to say that. But I mean, you could 
you can make an argument for Harry Kane, Alexis Sanchez, Lukaku, because they're all slightly different, that's the thing about them. Uh, but no, he can, he can match up against anyone. And the, and the next thing for him is maybe to be the, the best striker in the league. And if he gets the golden boot, you can't argue with that. And then maybe go on, you know, because he's still only, what, 23? You know, in his late 20s, become one of the best strikers in the world. Joe, was someone who knew a little bit about the art of goal scoring, just how good a finisher is Romelu Lukaku? Oh, he's outstanding. Obviously, the, the statistics tell you that. But his all-round finishing, uh, he's remarkably good with his right foot for a left footer. They tend to be one-sided. His heading's improving as he gets older, as he gets more mature. And, and it's got to the, the state now when if he misses the chance, you're surprised. If he gets clear, particularly on his left side, and, and he tends to do that late on in the game when defenders are losing a little bit of concentration and get tired. If, he's, if he gets loose in that position, he seldom misses. Is the key in the Merseyside derby snod get the ball to Big Rom as soon as we can? We've got to get the ball first. Uh, it won't be that easy, does uh, Anfield. They're a, good, they're a good side. Let's not get away from that at Anfield. But when we do get it, we've got to get it down the channels. As Joe said, uh, there's no better sight when we've been doing the commentary, does if we get the ball forward down the channels to Rom and he's got a one on one with a defender probably just outside the, the line of the 18 yard box, you more or less guarantee it's a goal because he does a little step over, whether it's left or right, and he finishes fantastically well. So uh, I'm hoping he's going to get two or three chances like that on, uh, on Saturday afternoon. For, for club and country this season, 28 goals in 32 games. How big is confidence for a striker? Well, it, it is confidence, you know, and, and he's not the noisiest of people. I've, seen, I've just seen him around the place. And by the way, you don't realise how big he is until you stand <laughs> next to him. Behemoth, the size of him all round. But he, he's also very, very quick. You know, I, I did read somewhere a few months ago, Eden Hazard said he's the quickest player he's seen. And there's, there's no doubt that once he, if he gets clear of, he's seldom caught. You know, I think it was a game against Sunderland and poor Oviedo tried to outmuscle him. No, doesn't happen. This could be Big Rom's weekend. He could end the weekend as a legend. Well, us Evertonians may have to go back to 1999 for our last victory at Anfield, but Ronald Koeman doesn't have to dig quite so deep into his own memory bank. The Blues manager was in charge of Benfica when they won a Champions League tie at Anfield in 2006. He'd love a repeat scoreline, wouldn't we all? And he's relishing the prospect of taking Everton there on Saturday. We're looking forward and... and, and... We need to prepare uh, the team for, for this Saturday. It's, it's difficult, but the same is for Liverpool. Still, we have not everybody back from international duty. And then you have maybe one day of training to prepare the team for 12.30 kickoff on Saturday. Uh, that's, that's difficult, but OK, I cannot change that. No, I think the, the motivation is that, that we in in a good run. We like to keep uh, the momentum and, and I think we played uh, in the home game against Liverpool during one hour really good. We make it really difficult to, uh, to Liverpool. We lost a little bit the control in the last 30 minutes and, and unlucky wise uh, they scored after 97, 98 minutes. And, uh, but we know we, know we, we, we are close uh, to beat them and, and okay, the next step is to show that uh, on this Saturday. You've been in, involved in many, many derbies as a player and as a manager. How does this one compare to, to the others you've been involved in? Well, it's, it's one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest in, 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 in many aspects. And uh, OK, but we need to focus ourselves on, on how, we, how we have to prepare the game, uh, how we need to play, how we can make it uh, really difficult to Liverpool and, and, and to create chances and to score goals and to win the game. You, you, you feel the, the importance uh, of the fans to have a good result this Saturday. It's a long time ago and, and every time more, uh, they are more hungry to, to win the game. But OK, that's understandable. Uh, that's all emotion about the fans. Uh, what I respect, we need to, to focus and prepare ourselves about the football side of the game. It's the Gaffer's first Anfield derby as Everton manager, but 
he certainly won't be phased or intimidated by it, will he? No, not at all. Not the career he's had as a player and a manager. Uh, he'll, he'll be nervous, I'm sure he will. He'll want to get a result for the Evertonians, who, since he's been at the club, I'm sure have reminded him every week <laughs> how important this game is on, on Saturday, whether it's a Goodison or at Anfield. So he'll know what's needed. Uh, hopefully he'll know what's needed to win this game and uh, he'll put it into practice. The players, the players have got to do it. He can only give so much advice and, and, and work on things. The players, when they cross that line, it's down to them. How sweet is it, as an Everton manager and an Evertonian to boot, to win a Merseyside derby at Anfield? Oh, it's outstanding. I, I was fortunate enough as a manager to be unbeaten against the Reds. Um, but apart from that first game, which is uppermost in my memory of derby games, when we, when we beat them 2-0, um, this, when we won at Hanfield, can Chelsea scored two, and uh, one ex-Liverpool player, I won't embarrass him by saying who said on the radio it was long ball football, and of oh, course, was it, Joe? no, <laughs> Tell I, I, no, I, I listen. Rush is a good guy. All right, <laughs> <laughs> and he'd, he'd said it was long ball football, and you look at it again, and you see the passing between Anders Limpar and and Andre and Paul ride out crossing the ball, and it, it was a great move. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just mentioned there Romelu Lukaku could be a legend by Saturday tea time. Any one of them could be a legend by Saturday tea time, not Any one of them. Any one of them. I don't care who it is, whether it's Rom. Do you know what? I'd love it to be somebody like Tom Davis. I, I was really just going to say, uh, listen, I, 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 I'm so excited for Tom. Mm. He, he's just come so far, so fast. Mm. You know, and he wasn't that far away early on in the season from going out on loan. Yeah. And then there he is now all of a sudden. He scored against Manchester City. I promise you this, he won't be bothered about it. I was just going to say that, Joe. You know him better than me. He won't no. be phased by it, will he? Not at all, no. Local boys love a Merseyside derby, don't they? And that's just about it. All the talking is nearly done. All we can do now is wait patiently for the 228th meeting of Everton and Liverpool, the most often played fixture in English football. My thanks to Snods and to Joe Royal for another great show. And don't forget, the best way to listen to the game is with me and Graeme Stewart from the Anfield commentary box on EvertonFC.com. Put us on and mute the TV, that's the way to do it. Right, to finish this week's show, here's a taster of the season ticket video that had everybody talking at Camp and Furnace on Tuesday night. That deadline, remember, Thursday the 6th of April to guarantee your own seat. We'll see you again next week. Favourite Everton chant. I used to love listening to Jojo Mexico, um, but I didn't make it to Mexico. I was only on standby. <laughs> It has to be Sheedy Sheedy when we got a free kick, so I have to be a bit. Uh, that, that's the best one, yeah. Yeah, that's the song. Favorite ever song is when they call um, one player, Romelu Lukaku or Miralas. I like this. Let's stay away. My father come to watch the game, and when I scroll, he said I sung the <laughs> with the fans. My favourite song from when I was a kid, probably Feed the Yach. <laughs> the celebration, you know, he used to do this. Nah, because he was flying back then, and I was a ball boy during the time, and I used to join in, so I was like literally on the edge of the pitch, and I remember that. It's a funny song. Scousers are witty people. The chants and the songs are incredible when you think that somebody sits down and thinks these songs up. <laughs> My brother sang it at my at my wedding. My older brother Stevie. He was just about to sit down before he uh, before he finished his speech, and uh, he says one more thing before I go. And he and he broke into the song, and the whole uh, wedding venue started singing. So it was great. I don't know. We made it up. Seeing on my um, Twitter timeline, um, a lot of Everton fans were tweeting it. And then the first time he had a Goodison, I was like, I was shocked. I had a thought that maybe the blues might make make a song for me and it's a good chant now, isn't it?